Hey everybody, John Brown here to talk to you about Legacy, the Testament of Duke de Crichy something. Um, don't let the box fool you. Uh, this game suffers from what I call Kalis Syndrome, where the box cover doesn't look all that inviting, and whereas Kalis is a pretty in-depth, um, not necessarily dry, but, but, you know, crunchy sort of Euro game, this game takes itself a little bit less seriously. Um, but it, but it certainly has quite a bit of game to it. It is a kind of mid-weight Euro, involves some hand management and some worker placement. So let's take a look at what the game looks like and how you play. Okay, this is what the main board's going to look like when we start the game. And we're going to have some different actions available to take on the main board some different things available to take, and we're going to have our own player board as well. Now, one thing that's interesting about the game, the, the point score up here kind of goes where it weaves around back and forth, and so does the player board. Um, just to point out, um, most of you are probably more intelligent than me, so it won't be a problem, but every once in a while I move the marker in the wrong direction because I was thinking the point should go a certain way. But... Um, like I said, hopefully, hopefully that won't be a problem for you. Um, let's go over, during the game, um, what you start with. First, you're going to start with a, I believe they're called a patron of the family. I uh, know the camera's not focusing very well, so we'll just, this is John Law, the famous economist, and he basically gives us an endgame scoring condition. If we have, um, we get nine points if we have at least seven income at the end of the game, and you'll see on the player board how that works. One nice thing about the game, um, the iconography is pretty good. Anytime you see um, a sort of money bag symbol, that's your income. Anytime you see like a shield, that's your prestige. Uh, there are potentially the sort of brown cards, that's the face down friend deck. These are the face up friends that you see here. And once you get used to the iconography, it's really pretty simple. Also on the card, you'll see a nationality and an occupation on many of the cards and those all come into play while you're playing the game. You're also going to start with somebody who's going to be the first member of your family. They will have two sides. Uh, these happen to be the same nationality, but they're slightly different. This one starts with, here we see that brown, uh, we draw five friends cards. We start with one income and eight starting money and a light blue extra action disc. This is pretty similar, the same extra action. A little bit less money to start with, but more income. So at the end of each round, we're going to get our income. So this person may not start as much starting cash, but has the potential to gain more during the game. I also want to point out, here's the money on these cards. I wish there had been a few more of them. We actually ran out of money in the game we played and just substituted other things in the game. So let's talk about what you can do on a turn. Well, when you start the game, you're going to start with your head of the family. This is the blue extra action disc, and then two disc in that player's color. So they basically in each round can take two actions, and this extra action is something we can do once during a generation. The game's going to play over three generations. The first generation is only two rounds. At the end of the first round, we get income, and this player, the main board, actually does a good job with iconography. You'll see at the end of each round, there's a symbol that we get money for income. At the end of each generation, we get points for our prestige, and for the number of children we had in that generation. First generation is two rounds, second generation is three rounds, and the final one is four rounds. And after each round we'll get our income, after each generation we'll get points for prestige, and for the number of children in that generation. And the only difference is at the end of round nine, the final round of the game, we don't get our income, however we reveal this card and do endgame scoring. Now, we have one endgame scoring, that's our goal, and then we have other two other potential endgame scoring, but we'll get to how you can unlock those, basically, and it's nice they're in red and we unlock them with these. So let's talk about the actions you can do on the main board. You can, both of these, either acquire a title or contribute to the community, or basically making ourselves, you know, bigger names by either getting a title or doing something useful to the community. They're going to have a cost, and they're going to have what they give us. This lets us draw four friends from the face down friends pile by making a contribution, uh, making a donation to the church. And we'll have different things and different costs. And after each generation, these cards will go away and we'll get new, more expensive, more powerful ones. So those are these two spaces. We can hire a family or a fertility doctor. Now, at the time, and the book does a great job of describing this, there there are historical reasons pointed out in the book. And this was kind of a new practice at the time. People frowned upon this. So if you do this, not only do you have to pay the doctor too money, but you lose a friend by doing so. But you can draw two cards instead of one when you choose 
this to have a child action. And we'll get to the basic child action on the other on your player board. We can buy a mansion. We lose a friend who maybe gets jealous, spend three gold, and but we get two prestige. So again, we see the two shield symbols here. So at the end of each generation, that's two more points. If we take a business venture, that gives us one more income, but we lose two friends and a victory point. Why? Well, big prestigious families didn't go into business. That was considered uncouth to try and make money like that. So we can get more money, but people are going to be upset at us about it. So really interesting thematic things going on as to why we pay the resources we pay. We can also undertake a mission where we lose a friend, but we try to, we get a mission that basically tells us if we complete these certain things, then we get points. Now, interestingly enough, that's how they work in the first two generations. If we take that action in the third generation, then this card basically, this red card basically is face down by our player board, and that is what allows us to unlock these bonus actions. So we could get up to two of them to unlock these potential bonus scoring, which usually gives us points for a certain amount of whatever it may be, um, money at the end of the game, um, number of couples at the end of the game. So we can go after those if we want, or we can completely ignore those, but we have to take this action during the third generation at least once, if not twice, to unlock both of those. Now here is the individual player board, and we'll see, same thing, we start at zero prestige and we weave around and try not to screw it up. Uh, I tend to screw it up more in the main scoreboard than on here. We keep track of our income, that will start with whatever our starting player has, but we can get more through uh, marriage or through um, things like going into business venture. We'll cover getting married, because that's kind of the main crux of the game. I'm actually going to cover that last. We can have more children, and we can either just draw one from the pile, or we can choose that we want a boy or a girl. We'll lose a point for doing so. There's some interesting things in the rule book about how and why this kind of works, but I'll just leave it at that. And we draw until we get a boy or a girl, or we could potentially get a complication, but we'll cover that in a second. We can also ask our friends for money. And if we just want a little bit, it's no big deal. If we want more, we lose a point. If we want a lot of money, we lose a point and a friend. And we can kind of, same thing, if we want more resources and friends, we can draw, and this is the face up from these friends, we can draw one from there for free. We can throw a bigger party and gain two friends, or throw a really big party and gain three. One interesting mechanism in the game is that any time that there would be one friend left, so for example, if there were three friends left out there, I could do the action to gain two friends. And well, this last person, they don't want to be left alone, so they'll come along with these friends because they don't want to be left alone and be left out of society. So it's an interesting little thing. When all these friends are gone, then five more will fill it up. So the timing of, oh, I really want that person, it might be more efficient for me to wait, but somebody might take it, so do I go after that person who has a good ability, or do I wait and hope to get more friends and make a more efficient move is something interesting throughout the game. Now let's look at the friends really quick. Each one of these friends that we'll have in our hand we gain more during the game and we can use as a resource will have a cost. This cost is important when we are marrying that person to someone in our family. They will have what they give us. Um, they will all have a nationality which can trigger certain things off other cards and many of them will also have an occupation here. And these symbols again matter for trying to complete missions or for other cards that we might have in our family. So now let's talk about actually getting married. Now when we do get married, let's say I wanted to marry my starting person to this person here. Now in general, now this person comes with a dowry. I actually get paid for marrying this person, but in general, the ones you pay more for are more powerful. But this one's still pretty good. I get to draw one friend and get a prestige, and then this ability says, discard all of the face-up friends from beside the board and draw a new set and take one of them. So each one of these are going to have different abilities. She also has her nationality and her occupation. And whenever I play a card like that, I took the get married action, we also draw a child card. They have a child instantly and then this is the where they are a young child and then at the end of the generation they'll become a teenager and they can get married. So right now I would draw one of these instantly if I got married. Now when you draw a child you can draw a boy like I drew there you can draw a girl. You can draw either a boy or a girl with a special power. This one, for example, says, um, well, she'll start as a child and then become a teenager and get married. And her special power, when she gets married, she has broad hips. Mm -hmm. Each time you draw a child card, ignore the complication cards. So, what does that mean? Well, 
Whenever you're drawing from this pile to have a child, you can draw a complications at birth. Whenever that happens, you have to choose either to lose the mother or the child. If you cho choose to lose a child, then you don't get a child for either when you got married or when you choose the have a child action on your player board or here. Or if you choose to lose the mother, you can get remarried if the original person in your family was a man. However, if this was your daughter, let's say, who died during childbirth, you you can't have a son-in-law get remarried. Kind of thematic, too. You know, we, we let the blood relatives get remarried. We don't care about the non-blood relatives. Now, as you can see by the art style, this game doesn't necessarily take itself too seriously. And through the thematics and the style and everything in the game, you can see they're kind of poking fun at this sort of society and how we you know, how this time valued what they thought was important and whatnot. And these friends are going to have a lot of variability in what they do. They can combo with each other. And how we combo them when we use them for resources is going to be a big crux of how we play the game. Okay, first potential negatives of the game. Um, yeah, I wish it had been a little more whiny. I wish the player boards had a little, a few more numbers on them to keep track of, track of things. So you don't have to keep track of it yourself if you go over. The cards are small, but they're small for a reason. The artwork and the iconography is good. You can get used to it really quick. Actually, I should point out the rule book is fantastic. Not only does it point out all these interesting things throughout history, but there's a lot of pictures. It's a big, thick rule book, even though the game isn't complicated, but that's a good thing. It shows you a lot of examples. It's really easy to reference. Really great job on the rule book. But this game takes up a lot of space. I was warned that it would take up a lot of space. It took up more than I expected. So you have to be ready for that and make sure you have enough room to play it. If you do have enough room, though, is this a game worth playing? Well, if you're really into, you know, crunchy, in-depth, I'm going to control everything, this may not be your game. There's a decent amount of randomness. What children you draw, what disc you get. At the start of each generation, you get one of those extra action discs. You have to use it during that generation. Maybe you don't want to take that action. Well, but you're probably going to because it's an extra free action. So, but there, there's some randomness there in what you get. However, what I really care about is, is a game fun. And this game is fun, in my opinion. If you're, again, looking for something really heavy, it's, it's, it's more of a midweight game. It doesn't take itself too seriously. You know, there are different strategies you can take, you know, having a lot of children, getting a lot of prestige, um, going for endgame scoring bonuses on your card. So there's enough variety there to keep the game interesting. But this is one of those games I'm not too concerned about whether I win or lose. It's just fun to watch what everybody else is doing. So if that's something that you like and it's just about having a good time, then I recommend this game. I'm not saying it's super light, it's not exactly a gateway game, but it's not super crunchy. And if that's what you're looking for, if you're looking for a game that looks like it would fit this cover, this might not be your thing. However, if you're just looking for fun and enough of a game that, you know, that, that fun does cause you to think, even if it doesn't cause you to have an aneurysm, then, you know, I pretty highly recommend this game, and I think it's worth checking out as long as you have the table space. All right, thanks a lot for watching, and hopefully we'll talk to you guys soon. As one more side note, I'd like to point out the added stability to this video. Um, thanks to uh, one of my uh, viewers and friends, actually, pointing out that my videos really need a tripod, and um, I agree. So, because I didn't want to go out and spend the money on one, I built one out of constructs that have two sides, one for when I'm looking at the camera and one to lean down towards the game. So if anybody remembers constructs, yay, these are the best building tools ever in my opinion, even though I can't get my son interested in them. And I spent quite a bit of money getting some off of eBay because mine were lost when my basement flooded when I was like in high school and whatever. So, but constructs are awesome and they work as a tripod. And Ember says hi too. Alright, so I uh, just thought I'd point that out, so hopefully you guys uh, like that. Uh, the, the video quality is a little bit more stable, except where I'm holding it right now. Alright, thanks a lot again, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.